So hey guys, we're back with another one. And uh, this one's been a long one coming uh, because I'm a huge fan of the guy and what he owns. Uh, before we get into that, I want to thank the folks over at the uh, Tombstone Epitaph, Arizona's longest running newspaper. You can uh, subscribe for 75 bucks, actually, excuse me, 60 bucks for three years. Um, that is $15 savings over going year to year to year. Uh, so if you want to be a subscriber and get the epitaph delivered right to your door, go to tombstoneepitaph.com. I also want to thank my second family over at the Wild West History Association. Uh, you can find them at wildwesthistory.org. Uh, they've got the journal. Uh, they've got tons of stuff going on for Western history. And you can also find the Wild West History Association on Facebook. They have a Facebook page, they have a YouTube page, and my good friend David Geiken, he's over uh, running the Instagram. Uh, you can find David over on Instagram. He's posting phenomenal content if you're an Instagrammer. So go see uh, the folks at Wild West History Association and become a member for 75 bucks a year for wildwesthistory.org. So on the phone is Phil Gessert, and... I had been reading in my research in the early stages about four or five years ago about Cochise County history. I'm a property owner in Cochise County and I'm just fascinated with the county. It just, it blows my mind every time I'm in town or doing something, just how beautiful it is. And one of the areas I went to when I found out about it was a Cochise hotel. And the first time that I went, it was closed. I didn't know anybody. I wasn't going to pound on the door. I didn't know if it was a hotel or a residence or whatever. And I was walking around in the street out front, hoping maybe somebody would come out so I could be like, oh, hey, hi, how are you? Nobody, <laughs> nobody came out. So then a couple of years or a year passed and there was an event called, uh, what was it? The Cochise County, uh, uh, haunted tour or the tour, uh, through, um, what is that through Joanne? What's the name of it? Ghost Town Trails Tour. And and our friend Joanne Rummel runs that along with Phil. And Joanne takes people on a road trip all across the center of Cochise County, some two amazing places. So if you want some fun, it's done twice a year. You can find them on Facebook at Ghost Town Trail Tours. And the hotel got opened up and there was this man standing there. And I was like, you know, hi, I introduced myself. Well, it became Phil Gessert. Well, Phil... <clears throat> Phil, actually, um, we had met Phil earlier at a faro table in Tombstone. And he taught my wife and I how to play faro. Well, I didn't put the two together until Phil was there. And then all of a sudden, oh, my God, you own a hotel. I says, you remember me? We did the faro table in uh, Tombstone. He said, yes. And now Phil is somebody that I consider a friend. He's a good friend. And he's somebody that I really like. And I've been wanting to interview him and about him and the ownership of the Cochise Hotel. So, hello, sir. Hey. Howdy. Uh, how are you? Excellent. So, you have a, a really cool story because not only do you own the hotel, but you are also are involved in film as a producer, a filmmaker, a screenplay writer. Uh, you've got over 40 years in the film business. You're, you hail from, I don't know, I'm going to ruin this. And if I do, Menominee Falls, Wisconsin. Is that right? You got it right. Oh, Menominee Hills, Wisconsin. So a guy who's Menominee Falls, raised, Wisconsin. What is it? Menominee Falls, Wisconsin. There you go. So you come from this really cool area. How did you end up in Hollywood? Well, in not Hollywood per se, because I know you didn't live in Hollywood. But how did you end up in Hollywood as a film producer, maker, screenwriter, playwright? Ah, well, I went to school at ASU. We, uh, my family moved to Arizona in 1971, and we bought a ranch down in Benson, which is part of Cochise County. Uh, I went to school at ASU as for photography and met a uh, film, took a filmmaking class and met a filmmaker who was teaching it and he says you you need to go to work son and so I, I went to work in his little studio making commercials and sweeping the studio floor for the most part and uh just uh kept working and working and became a 
uh, the editor of Phoenix and started a company and, and, uh, the next thing I knew I was over in California, uh, working over there. But you weren't just working over there because when I looked at your repertoire of films that you've been, like if you go online and put in your name, there's a, you've been busy, like you're doing some really great stuff. So what are the, some of the things that we would know? Oh, I got into a lot of television type things uh, and kind of got pigeonholed into reality TV. And we did the real world and road rules and amazing race and all, you know, Joe Millionaire, tons of simple life, tons of reality TV. I also did a lot of music videos for people like uh, Robbie Robertson and Paula Abdul and Hammer and and a ton of commercials. So you you were busy. I mean, you were busy long before the hotels even appeared. You were super freaking busy doing Hollywood and, and living the life um, in the film business. And I know some people think, oh, my gosh, it was so glamorous. It is it is a glamorous life, but it's a hit and miss life, I would assume. Well, people would tease me because I was a I was an editor for the most part and a working editor, which meant I actually drew a paycheck pretty much every week, which of course in Hollywood is a hard thing to do. And, uh, you know, it's not a glamorous life, especially in the editing room where you're closed in with four walls and a couple of people and, and you work until three, four, five in the morning, then you're back out again at eight to go to an online session. And, oh, it's a, it's a grind. And that's why I ended up back in Cochise County because I retired and came back to Arizona and uh, found the hotel. But there was this, but in between there, you moved to Tombstone, and I don't want to, the Tombstone times were, were good times and bad times, but you ended up in Tombstone for a while. How long did you live in Tombstone? Actually, I didn't live in Tombstone. Oh. I lived in Benson, but I had a shop. I opened up a gambling casino oh, yeah. in Tombstone off the beaten path off Allen Street. And we were only there for, I'd say, six months and uh, just couldn't get the people in off of Allen Street. So you're in the film business. Now, when you retired, have you gone back to the film business? Have you done any special projects? Or are you out? Oh, no. If somebody comes to me with a project and I like it, I'll do it and have done several. I've worked up in uh, Missoula, Montana for a while on Mountain Man and Went over to Austin, Texas, and and did storage uh, or shipping wars. You know, so I would do um, other projects in different parts of the country if uh, if I was called. Okay, so if you hear Hollywood, Phil's Phil's ready. Um, when you got back into Cochise County and you were in Tombstone, were you looking for a change, like away from? your business in Tombstone? Were you looking for something? Were you working at that time? And then, and I know it's probably a short amount of time, maybe, I could be wrong, or what was the time before the Cochise Hotel, before you went out there the first time, or how did you get out there and see this building and go, oh my gosh? I was in Benson living there, and uh, unfortunately got a a little trouble with my wife, got a divorce, and kind of, Left the ranch. We had an 80 acre ranch there in Benson. And, uh, and so I was kind of homeless for a while looking around the streets and found this old dilapidated building. Nobody wanted it. It had been vacant for about four or five years and kind of falling apart. And the price was right. <laughs> so, um, I bought it and started fixing her up and I bought it to be a home. And of course I still live here. But uh, as I was fixing it up, people kind of started visiting, going, well, you got to open this up because it's kind of like a museum in here. I've got all kinds of artifacts that I've collected over the past 50 years. And so, um, yeah, I started doing tours. The next thing I know, people that asked me to stay here. and So I opened it up as a bed and breakfast, and and that's where I'm at. But as as simple as it sounds, the hotel was... In really bad shape. The the original owners, and we're going to kind of go through the hotel because you know the history better than I do. But 
The original owners and creators were the Raths, who sold to the Womack family. Eventually, a guy named John Skinner came along and purchased it. And then there was a lady named Elizabeth Gunter. And she, and then Elizabeth, I think she got married to the husband family. And the husband family were part of the Amarin Foundation. Her father, I think, created the Amarin Foundation. And that's who you bought the hotel from. So all these people are involved in, am I correct on that? Oh, you got your history down. Yeah. Okay. And so how did it go about that you showed up at the hotel and did you go to the Amarin Foundation where they opened to selling it? What happened? Tell us that story. Oh, it was a simple story. They were looking to get rid of it and unload it off of their pay book. <laughs> and so they, uh, that's why they sold it to me. And, you know, Mrs. Husband, her parents were the uh, Fulton family, the inventors of the steam engine. So they were quite wealthy. Mm-hmm. And, and so they're the ones that ended up working the Ameren Foundation. And Mrs. Hunter, uh, uh, her husband, I mean, uh, bought the hotel and then bought all the acreage in between the hotel and the Ameren. And uh, she's the one that actually did the first fix up of the hotel, putting in an air conditioning and heating system, metal roof and expanded bathrooms into each room because there was only one bathroom to begin with. Um, and of course that was in the 1950s. So by the time I got here, everything was already old again. But when, but when you, the Amarins, you probably drove over cause the Amarin site is in Dragoon. Did you just drive over there and say, Hey, I hear you guys own the hotel. You want to get rid of it? I'd love to own it. Or was there a big for sale sign out front? Yeah, a big for sale sign out front oh, wow. and a, a real estate agency who was, who was carrying it. And I never even met the Ameren people until um, after I'd owned it and after I, you know, kind of settled into it. Well, if you're wondering who we're talking to, we're talking to Phil Gessert. Um, he owns the Cochise Hotel in Cochise, Arizona. Uh, it is a gorgeous place. If you want to see some video, you can go on my YouTube video at HVAC Reefer Guy. That's my uh, my blue collar channel, and I've got some extended video, including a walking tour from the front to the back, and uh, it came out really well. And if you really want to read more about the Cochise Hotel, go to CochiseHotel.net. Now, is that where they would book the rooms is through the hotel website, or where do they go to book rooms? They can book it through the website, and a lot of people do. Uh, most of the time, people just look up hotels in the Wilcox area, and I pop up and they make the call. Well, if you don't want to go through all of that and you're a listener, go to CochiseHotel.net. It is a fabulous website. And I, and I don't, sometimes I recommend, recommend websites and they're pretty good. This one is a fabulous website because it breaks down the entire history of the hotel. You can book it there. You can see photos. You can see what it looks like. It's just a fantastic website. And so to go to CochiseHotel.net. Very good. Yeah, I wish I had. I haven't looked at it for a few months myself. So it's good. I looked at it this morning. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. It's still working. You're still That's working. So news. if you see like a hundred views in the last month, they're probably all mine. <laughs> well, um, you sure got your history down. That's for sure. So well, because I, I love the hotel and I'm a big fan of what you're doing. Um, so the original hotel, the original town of Cochise wasn't there and I read through your website that John Rath was a telegraph operator in Fort Bowie he was actually the camp agent and he somehow convinced the Southern Pacific Railroad to put a railroad depot a train depot there because he could provide water and he dug a well and the Southern Pacific said, well, you've done everything you said you would do. And boom, Cochise is formed. Is that correct? That's correct. John Rath was an entrepreneur of the Old West and truly an amazing, amazing man. He came to just a stretch of, it used to be a Chinese work camp here for the railroad. And he saw that this had the potential. He dug a well. He convinced the railroad to go in. He, he drew up the town and uh we homesteaded it so that now he could sell off little lots on the town 
and uh, they became quite wealthy and and were quite successful in creating and making the town of Cochise. But the town of Cochise, because the hotel is there, there's a general store across the street, which I'm dying to get into, which someday I will. You know, we'll figure it out. But you had the hotel, and then you had these outlying buildings and properties all around the town. So the houses that are there, including the church and all that, was that all the original part that John that John Rath laid out? No, he came here in 1897. This is the oldest working hotel in Arizona. And uh, the, the mercantile across the street wasn't built until 1913. The church was built in around 1900, but then it had a fire and was rebuilt in the 1930s. Uh, but so the town, it grew up, and there are only a very few buildings that are left from the uh, 1800s. The properties that you have, but the buildings that you have out back on your property, including the water tower, that's all original, mm -hmm. correct? That's Yes, that's original. Some of those buildings were actually over across the street at the railroad camp, and they were places for the railroad people to stay in, and uh, and then they picked those buildings up and, and moved them here. And, of course, the railroad station itself was picked up in about the 1970s, I think, and moved away uh and so now there's nothing left but a few forms and and uh, cement blocks which which i've been over there many times do you know by chance where the railroad depot was moved to yes it was moved across the street from the power plant um on 191 which used to be route 666 mm -hmm. uh and then the power plant purchased the property that the railroad uh, depot was on and they dug a great big hole and it's now buried on that property so that the expansion of the power plant could take place. Wow. So I, you know, I was hoping you were going to say, yeah, Mike, it's, it's over here um, or, it's, <laughs> or it's over there yeah. and off we go. You got a like, shovel? Yeah. Phil and I are making a road trip. <laughs> That's oh, a bummer because you know a lot of times buildings, especially with the railroad, they're they're torn down and repurposed in other places. And so I was really hoping that was going to stay intact. If you wonder, you can actually go on CochiseHotel dot net, CochiseHotel dot net, and see the photos of what the train station looked like across from the hotel. And he's got pictures there, and it's just it's like walking back in history. And of course, if you want to book rooms at the hotel. You can go to CochiseHotel.net. Mm -hmm. When the, ho the hotel was called, originally called Rath Hotel, obviously for the, for the John Rath who, who built the hotel, when, when the Raths had that going, they put an ad into the paper. I believe they put an ad into the paper for a housekeeper type Roll, correct me if I'm wrong, and a lady sh na showed up named Kate Ornery, or as we Mary would know Cummings. her, as Big Nose Kate. Tell that yes. fascinating story. Her, her name was actually Mary Cummings, Mary Cummings. when she came here. Uh, she had just divorced a Mr. Cummings, which she had married. That was like her third or fourth husband or boyfriend or whatever, Doc Holliday being one of the first. Uh, yes, and she moved in here and, and worked here for nearly a year through 1900. And uh, then she met a fellow by the name of Jack Howard and became a housekeeper for him over in Dusko Basis, which she stayed for for many years. Um, but she certainly was here as the housekeeper and not a brothel. And but, they, uh, <laughs> she worked the laundry for the most part. But did... Is it a is it a fairy tale when I was read somewhere that Mrs. Rath had no idea who was in her employment as far as uh, Mary or or Kate, and she had no idea who it was until some people that knew Kate in other lives started telling her, "Hey, do you know who that is?" That's right. Well, Mrs. Rath. Lulu was her name, uh, is the daughter of Joe Hill. And Joe Hill was one of the 
cowboys, uh, red red sashes. Of course, they didn't actually wear them, but uh, he was great friends with the uh, Clantons and McLowrys and Johnny Ringo and Curly Bill Brocious. They used to hang out at his ranch up in San Simon. And in fact, there's a, a, a census from one of the years where all those guys wrote their names at the Joe Hill f- farm because they were all hanging out there when the census mm. keeper came around. And, and so, uh, of course, Mrs. Rath, uh, as a young child was living and these guys were like her uncles and friends because they always were coming out and hanging out with her father. And I'm sure she heard many of negative stories about the herbs and about Doc Holliday and maybe even about Big Nose Kate. Uh, and then of course she didn't want anybody to know her name so that Mrs. Rath wouldn't, uh, find out about it. And of course she did. And of course she was fired. So when she was fired, it kind of was coincidence then that Jack Howard across the valley at Dos Cabezas, and if you're wondering, Dos Cabezas means means two heads in Spanish, and you can actually see the the Dos Cabezas from the hotel, and you can kind of visualize, you know, Mary heading that way, heading east. Did she answer an ad in the paper, or was it through the grapevine that Jack was looking for a housekeeper? I do believe there was another ad in the paper that that asked her ask for the help of a housekeeper. So she she picks up her stuff and said, "I'm not wanted here. I'm out." And which was probably a great relief. She goes to Dos Cabezas and then lives there for thirty years. Becomes a common law wife to to Jack. But the Correct. hotel the hotel is still running. Was that was she the only notable person? I mean, really, to work there, or were there others? Oh, I'd say she was the main one, other than the Raths themselves. And uh, the Raths only had it for a few years, and then, it, as you you said, it was taken over by the Womacks. And so, um, it used to be called the Cochise Hotel and Waterworks because of the water was big. Uh, they had the great well here. The railroad used the water. People would come from miles around to do their laundry in the in the laundry that they'd had built here, and and uh, other wells started popping up throughout the town. So then the town grew. Um, but th- but there were a lot of f- famous people who visited here. The first governor of Arizona did a, a you know, and in about 1910 did a road trip with a bunch of the old cars. And the road that's out in front of the hotel used to be the main thoroughfare from Tucson to El Paso. And so, of course, the that group spent the night here. And Buffalo Bill came through here to go down to Disney and Douglas and do their shows. The railroad here. Um, so there there have been quite a few, you know, visitors. Johnny Beam, um, some of John Slaughter, some of the old people that used to hang out in this area. Henry Hooker. Uh, would use the Cochise Hotel as a meeting point, as well as uh, Warren Earp. Well, so then Warren Earp is buried in Wilcox. And incidentally, if you don't know, Warren is the only Earp buried in Arizona. But when John, before Lulu sold it, John had a horrible death. Did he not? Yes, he did. He was out on a hunting trip, had his uh, rifle between his legs in the back of the wagon, and somehow it went off and blew his head off. Mm, horrible way to go. Horrible way to go. They did a big inquiry about it, though, and absolutely found it to be an accidental death because um, a few people were suspicious, but it was indeed an accident. So she, Lulu now holds the hotel. Did she stay up with it? Or was she wanting to get out of it? She she wanted to get out of it. She still had all these lots to sell. Um, so she, she ended up finding the Womax, who actually had the second hotel in Cochise down the street. Uh, it was a little two-story building. And so the Womax had been running that hotel. So when they found out this one was available, they purchased it. And how long did they own the hotel? Only for about... Less than 10 years. And then the Skinners bought it. They had it for about 20. Uh, and uh, then Mrs. Husband came along. 
So when did it go from the Rath Hotel to the Cochise Hotel? I don't remember the actual dates, but it it would have been somewhere in the 1910 area. Mm. They wanted to get the Rath name off of the hotel and make it their own. Correct. When Amarin purchased it, actually, was it Amarin purchased it or was it when Elizabeth Husband came along? That was her name. Elizabeth Husband was her last name. Mm -hmm. When she came along, she was part of the Amarin family. So the Amarins just kind of brought it into their books, per se, when she passed. That's what happened. Yeah, they didn't actually own it. But when she passed, she kind of gave it to her family. And I've met a lot of her kids. Her kids and grandkids, they're wonderful people. Uh, it kind of passed down to them, and they decided they just weren't up for it um, and let it go. When you, uh, when you saw the hotel for the first time and you maybe did a walkthrough with a real estate agent, can you go through that? Did you walk in the door and go, holy crap? Or did you walk in the door and look at your partner or look at yourself in the mirror and say, I have found my home. I, uh, I did that when I just drove by it. It's so cool on the outside, all these old great buildings. I walked in and loved it so much. And my wife at the time and I was, had kind of thought about it, starting a B and B or doing something. And, and she didn't like it too much work, too much, effort and of course within a few months we had gotten the divorce and this place was still available so i came back to it and went hey i'm in but was it all beat up on the inside did it have years of neglect no it wasn't really that bad the 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 actual wall structure double adobe is is in excellent condition for a 130 year old building Uh, the floors are all in good shape it's got a new roof. It had a new roof on it. So I was pretty happy with the, that part of it. But the, of course, all the water lines, the sewer lines, the electric lines, the gas lines, you know, I got red tagged on everything and everything had to be redug up and redone. Um, that's where the, the hard work and money came in. But you also noted on the website, which is cochisehotel.net, you noted on the website that the front got a new front, the facade, got a new facade. Was the old one falling apart? No, the old one was just the typical, uh, you know, framed building with a, with a steep roof, steep pitch roof. Uh, and one of some of the pictures I've got of the Rath House have that building with the old steep pitch roof. Uh, and then uh, in about the 1910 or 15, it's called a cinder wall. And I guess it's to protect the building from the cinder and, and smoke that came out of the railroad because this was Front Street. It was right across the street from the depot, so right next to the trains. Uh, and so uh, it, they had built this cinder wall on the front, and that's stayed there now until this day. So you got this property, and I'm I'm just so you know, I'm like visualizing the whole thing as we talk because... I've now been in it quite a few times and it's um it's like walking back. Like if you <clears throat> we have a mutual friend, Sharon. I'm gonna give Sharon Hathaway a, a shout out. Absolutely. And Sharon will dress in period piece. And when I walk in that front door, if I were to close that front door, I would feel like I'm back in the eighteen hundreds. When the screen door slams behind you, yep, you transported in time. And so she she dresses and she will work the front counter at special events, and uh, she's just a terrific lady. Mm-hmm. When you got the hotel, I'm going to dig deep into the hotel now. <clears throat> I've always looked at the attic and always, and everybody always wants to know what was up in the attic. Did you find any cool stuff in the attic? <laughs> I wish. No. Uh, no, I've been. You know. There's an old latrine out and back I'm dying to dig up and, uh, and I, I, or I'd love to pull up the floorboards underneath the front porch, but no, I've not found anything, uh, cool around the hotel. We've done some excavating with a radar, uh, you know, ground sweeper and I found a couple of coins and some, uh, 
actually some tokens from what used to be the saloon next door. Hmm. But uh, other than that, uh, this place has been pretty well picked over. Uh, so and the attic is, is now just full of air conditioning ducts. Oh, God, I was hoping you were going to say, yeah, we opened it up and there was a basket. And we opened the basket, you know, like <laughs> something crazy, crazy. Um, as you said, you were purchasing lots. Now, there are buildings in the back that you do different stuff with. Um, where, you know, the washing area, <clears throat> for me, the, the attraction and people blow by it is the, is the acetylene generator from Colt. Um, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. People will blow by it and not even know. And I, even sometimes on the tours, I'm like, do you know what this is? And I'll actually talk to people about it because I'm in the HVAC business and acetylene is what we use for a uh, gas for, for brazing along with oxygen. So you got this oxygen generator. But then you got this other building in the back that's for games of the 1800s. And that's something that you're really known for worldwide, which is being, I don't know, I want to say reenactor. I think there's a different word like you and your friend Pico have. Um, what, and, and Jeff Smith up in Williams. Tell it, tell us about that because that's fascinating that we met at a Pharaoh table in Tombstones, city park at a pavilion and yet that's something that you really do and when i was a young man i read a lot about the old west and came to tombstone a lot of course and i became infatuated with luke short uh, he's the uh, the greatest western character of all time nobody's ever made a movie about him i don't understand it he's the only guy that's ever stood face to face with another famous gunfighter and had a, a shootout and uh and he was the big time Pharaoh dealer. In fact, when Wider bought the Oriental Saloon, he was already famous as a Pharaoh dealer up in Dodge City. And so Wyatt brought him and Bat Masterson and, and the owner of the Long Branch Saloon, Bill Harris, to Tombstone to outfit the uh, new gambling venture that Wyatt was into there at the Oriental. Uh, Luke Short killed a guy down there in Tombstone and and but nonetheless, I, I kept reading Pharaoh, Pharaoh. It's all about Pharaoh. And what is this game? And I looked around for parts to play it. And of course, nobody had it. Um, I finally found a fellow by the name of Shea Maxwell, who was building some reproductions. And so I was able to get the outfit and, and start learning the game. And yeah, I've, I've become, uh, you know, the mentor for just about every Pharaoh dealer in the country at this point, because I've either sold them my reproductions or taught them how to play the game. And uh, when people from the movie business want to put a faro table in their Western, they call me and I make it for them, like the movie, the TV series Westworld or Boardwalk Empire. Um, I outfitted those people with their faro tables and taught them how to play the games and, and sometimes actually sit the tables during the shooting. I love Boardwalk Empire, so I didn't know that. Um, huge fan of that show, but you've got, I don't want to just say Pharaoh because Pharaoh was a big part. Why was, why was Pharaoh so popular during the 1800s when it's so sided with the house or were the odds better than what they think they were? No, the odds of Pharaoh, if it's played straight are 50, 50, you can't get those odds anywhere in Vegas. And that's why the game disappeared because. Vegas had it for a little while in their casinos, but dropped it pretty quickly because there was no money in it for them. Uh, so all these cowboys and miners and they had the ch they actually had a chance to win. Uh, and that's why the game was so popular. It's fast moving. It's very easy to understand and you can actually win money. Now, of course, most of the Pharaoh dealers knew that, that they didn't have much of a chance. So, Oh, they came, they decided to do other things to try to win. I, I hate to say cheating, but I guess I'll say it. Well, it is cheating. So how would, how would these people cheat at Pharaoh when it's really an open face card game? Well, there were dealing boxes that would deal double cards and they had other tricks to how they shuffled the cards in order for them to get in the box and come out and, and, uh, be in favor of the house and, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, 
it's not easy. I've been playing it for a long time, and I, I, you know, it's not easy to cheat. Okay. But when I play it for for real uh, or with my customers, we never play for real money. It's always fake money, but. Right. Uh, I usually win. I, I don't know why. Even though I, I the odds are all uh, are even, uh, I'll clean them out for the most part. And it's mostly because those guys didn't know how the strategy of the game goes. Uh, I would imagine that if Luke Short have walked up to a a faro table in some other saloon, he might well have won. But and of course, faro that- is famous for people who lost everything in their game. In fact, there's a a table up in. Nevada called the suicide table and three or four people owned that Pharaoh table and lost everything they had and committed suicide. So that particular table got a reputation. Later they turned it into a 21 table and uh, kind of, but now it's still set up as a Pharaoh table and with big signs around it calling it the suicide table. But I can understand why people would lose because when we first played it, in fact, I think I broke even and made a little against the house. And when my wife was sitting next to me playing, she lost it all. And I think right. it's because it's, I don't want to say simple because it's not a simple game. But you're playing on a, on a face-up card and there's ways to place the bet to where you could either lose or lose but break even and not lose at all. Why did, is that the reason they got rid of Pharaoh is just because of the cheating? And be, like you said, because the house wasn't making it what it should. That's or, right. Or was you there, there a game like, like roulette or 21? You've right. got huge odds for the house and, right. and not with Pharaoh. Gotcha. You know, you know, Wyatt Earp was probably hmm. arrested a oh, half a dozen times for running race Pharaoh games. Uh, they would get some sucker that had a lot of money and they'd talk them into coming upstairs and going to their private faro table and they would have it all rigged. Maybe the, maybe they even had a cold deck, which means that they've stacked the deck inside the box and somehow they shuffle in front of the guys and then switch the deck out real quick. And now the dealer and, and perhaps a shill who would, who would sit at the other side would be able to bet and they knew every card that was coming out and the order it was coming out. So they were able to manipulate it and, and screw these guys out of money, big money. And a lot of times those guys then would go to the police. And like I said, he went to jail and several occasions for having, uh, what they called brace games, cheating. So if you're wondering who we're talking to about Pharaoh and the Cochise Hotel, we're talking to Phil Gessert. He is the owner of the Cochise Hotel in Cochise, Arizona. Uh, it is Arizona's longest running hotel. Um, it's still in operation. You can still stay there. And if you'd like to stay there, which I highly recommend you do, um, you, it is a B&B, so you get breakfast, and they do wonderful campfires out back. And it, it's, I'm telling you, it's, and if you're a train buff, you've got to stay there because the trains are running all the time. And if you're a train guy like me, I, I still, when I'll be at the hotel, I'll still rush out front to see the train go by. Um, but if you want more information, go to CochiseHotel.net. You not Very only... Good. What's that? Very good. Okay. You, you, st- you are involved more, though, in Western history than most folks think. You also at one point told me that you owned Wyatt Earp's claim near Vidal. That's correct. The happy day and the lucky day mine. Do you still own them? I do not. I sold them to, I won't give you his full name, but Eric who bought them out and he's, he was uh, excited about it and used to be a big part of wild west magazine. And so he owns it now, but boy, we used to have a lot of fun going out there camping out on the site that Wyatt Earp used to camp on. And we have photographs of where he, somebody went out there when he was there and took pictures of his campsite. And so we know exactly where it is. We set our tents up just where he was. And I did a lot of digging around there. I, I bought the thing not to mine the mine, but to mine the artifacts that might've been in the area. And I found quite a few fun things. So tell us about that because Somebody just doesn't walk up unless they do, and it's that simple. Just doesn't go to the counter recorder building or wherever they go and say, today I'm buying 
Wyatt Earp's mind, the happy, happy day and the lucky day. Tell us about that. <laughs> I bought it on eBay. Really? Yeah, I found it on eBay and my wife, I said, God, this would be so fun. And my wife said, I'll buy it for you. And so she did. <laughs> it was we that, had a lot of, it was that simple. That simple. Yeah. Of course you can buy it anytime. If you go to a, um, you know, the BLM, which is where it is. And, um, keep an eye out. Maybe it's going to fall out someday and somebody could pick it up again pretty cheaply. Because the, the mine is real close to where a mutual friend of ours, Terry Ike Clanton, he owns Wyatt Earp and Josephine's home in Vidal. That's correct. That is just insane. See, it, that's why, that's why if people are wondering, like sometimes why I do the podcast is because it's, it's you think that the Western history is so big and it is so big, but there's so many wonderful people that are involved in it, like Phil and Terry and, uh, and Terry owns it and has got it kept up beautifully. It's just fantastic. When and go ahead. Terry's going to be driving out here with about 50 famous road race, uh, motorcycle people. Hmm. And this afternoon they're going to come over here and have lunch on their big run from Tombstone up to here and then back to Tombstone again. Awesome. Well, he's he's a great guy. I just met him last weekend, and um, but I've known of him. You can actually find Terry on uh, Instagram at Bionic Vegan. Uh, he's a vegetarian, lives a great, healthy lifestyle, and he's always putting in cooking stuff and, and food if you're a vegetarian. So check him out on Instagram at Bionic Vegan. When... Uh, when you sold the claim to the mine, was was that it for mining, or do you own other claims? Oh no, that's the only claim I've I've had, and uh, like I said, it wasn't specifically to do the mining because I think that mine has been played right. out long ago. But was the was it just surface mining, or was there a shaft? Was there a was there an adit that that why it was working? There are, there are holes in the ground and sh there's one shaft that goes down at least a hundred feet and, and then kind of crosses it over even further. I don't know how much of that Wyatt dug with his pick and shovel. Mm -hmm. Um, but it never was a huge producer, although Wyatt would go and to his, uh, mine over there in the Whipple Mountains and then he'd come home back to Los Angeles where he lived with his pockets full of gold and people were, all excited about it, but the, the the rumor is that he would go off to some mines, maybe even on Indian property, and mm -hmm. actually get strike it rich. And he just you would use the uh, happy day or lucky day as a cover to pretend like he got it from there. That's awesome. I'll, the whole story is great. As as the hotel pushes forward into the future. You're doing the Pharaoh, but you do other games too, right? You've got Al Capone's roulette wheel. Is that true? I have a, I have a, poem, I have a 21 table that was in the uh, south side of Chicago in George Capone's George uh, Capone. casino, Al's brother. But you've got everything in that, in that room that's in the back of the hotel. That's all historic pieces other than the Pharaoh table that was probably rebuilt by or built by you. Yes, but I have some Faro, original Faro equipment, of course. There's a, a 1900s hazard, grand hazard table, which is a really fun game that still is played under some Chinese name. I don't remember what it was, but in Las Vegas. And then I've got a, a old uh, crafts table from Tombstone, uh, from the old days. I've got a old roulette wheel and table, um, from H.G. Evans, uh, makers. Uh, so, you know, I've been collecting the gambling thing long before I thought about getting in the hotel business and I do the gambling thing. We go to the magic castle or did do that before COVID every year for 15 years and put on a, uh, a giant casino night at the castle. We go, we, we now have, uh, jobs in Calico, uh, ghost town and, um, several other places where we go every year and put on a big casino and, and for, big 1800s gamblers um, now you're part of a group right where i mentioned pico and and jeff smith up in williams he's the 
the Soapy Smith uh, reenactor. Are you part That's of a correct. group? Oh, yes. Delusion? Delusion? I'm sorry. No, are you part uh, of no, a group? I, I'm here. Oh, did I? Are you part of a group with Jeff Smith and Pico that does reenacting? Um, or is it just like a bunch of guys that hang out? Well, no, we, when we started doing those casino nights at the Magic Castle, I, I of course needed dealers. So I started bringing people in and, uh, Pico was one of those guys. Of course, it was the Jeff Smith wake is what they called it. Mm. Uh, the Soapy Smith Wake. And so Jeff would always be there. So I got to know him. And, and then we all decided to just take it on the road. Um, and yeah, so if we can, we've gone down to the Oriental and set up. Um, and if we can, we'll find a place to to put on the, the show. So what is the history then? Because I like Jeff Smith. Uh, I've, I've seen Jeff several times, but we ran into each other by accident. Uh, in Williams, we were like, Mike, Jeff, you know, like, you know, longtime brothers. And we run into him in Prescott. He's just a terrific guy. Um, what is the future of the hotel? Because you, it's the reason I ask is the hotel is where it's at. It's not going anywhere. But now That's you're right. starting to purchase places in the, in the area. You just purchased the church and some outbuildings to the west of the hotel. What is your goal for Cochise? Well, if I had if I had the money, I'd I'd turn Cochise Front Street, and I own most of it at this point, uh, into an old West uh, bring Cochise back the way it used to be, put in a saloon and and have the open the emergent mercantile across the street. And, but uh, you know uh, that's a long ways away. In fact. Um, if somebody else had the money and, and is here listening to this podcast and wanted to invest in a, in a cool new Western town, uh, this is the place. Well, it kind of brings up, because I've had people in Tombstone, well, not in Tombstone, but people that I know that would say, God, I would love to be able to go to a saloon exactly the way it looked in the 1800s with no flat screen TV, no digital cash register. Like I would belly up to a bar for a shot of, you know, whiskey or whatever and sit at a crappy table, you know, even though it was modernly made, a crappy table on a crappy chair to know what it sounded like and smelt like and felt like in the 1800s. And instead, we end up going to bars with flat screen TVs and cash registers and modern taps. You know, that is that the goal? Because I think people would well, go that's for it. Too, that's Tombstone for you. No, I know, but they, I mean... They've commercialized it quite quite heavily. Uh, I mean, if you want to get kind of real, I've been involved lately in the... Um, and set up a faro table in the new old uh, western town called Mescal. For, it was a movie set. Yeah, been there a bunch. And, and they're bringing that thing back to life. Uh, and, and, you know, there it is, pretty rugged. It's still back to the old way it was. Well, you got the ghost town of, and you got ghost town of Shakespeare in New Mexico that is gorgeous. Um, Dave, friend of mine, Dave Obenshine owns that. And the Mescal, I think, is owned by the Karchners, and they're just, they're revitalizing it. It's just, I've been there on cleanup days. It's gorgeous, um, what they're doing to the town. So you're going out there and doing stuff then, correct? That's right. It's fun. Wow. Because not, not only are they trying to build back the history of the Old West, but then they've also got the history of the movie business. You know, the movie Tombstone was shot there. And, and all the way back to Winchester 73, they've had a 100 movies shot there. So, uh, you know, Clint Eastwood was there on, uh, on Outlaw Josie Wales and shot some scenes in that town. So it's, it's, a, it's cool to hang out there and for both reasons, the Western history and movie history. So I think we've covered it. Other than my, my question about, you know, the future uh, tombstone, I mean, of Cochise, you know, when you bought the church, was that easy to purchase or was it a private church? It's a private church. It's the coolest old church built like every other old church ever was. And, and, uh, I, I bought it because I thought we'd start doing weddings here and then use the hotel as a reception area and do the old West wedding, uh, at the church. Um, but boy, it's hard to get into the wedding business. <laughs> well, 
If you're thinking about getting married and you're listening to this and you're wanting a true 1800s, not a not a fancy ghost town with cars all around, but if you're wanting a true 1800 history a wedding, go to CochiseHotel.net, contact Phil. That's the place to go, and he'll call you right back, and uh, he can set something up because uh, if you're thinking, even though if you look at Cochise, you're like, oh, the heck is out here in the middle of nowhere? It actually isn't in the middle of nowhere. It's it's in the heart, the, the northern heart of uh, Cochise County. You're close to Wilcox, and uh, I'm telling you, you have a great time. Anything that you want to add before we go about the hotel and about Cochise and about you? No, about you only, that I, I appreciate you, and you've really done a heck of a job, oh. you know, promoting Cochise and the town, I'm, and not just the town, but the county and the whole Southern Arizona thing. And I respect what you've been doing and appreciate being on your show. I, I paid him to say that. So if you're wondering, I paid him to say that. Thank you, Mr. Gresham. <laughs> <Not even. laughs> um, again, if you want to find out about the Cochise Hotel, go to Cochise.net. Um, there is so much there. And I urge you to really make the stop, put it on the map. It's like, if I say it's easy to get to, it is super easy to get to. It's all paved roads. No four-wheel drive is needed. And you literally will step onto the property. You'll open that front door, step into the lobby of the hotel, and you will feel like you just stepped back to the 1800s. It is a phenomenal experience. And I, any chance I get to get down to the hotel, I'm stopping and I'm seeing Phil. And even if Phil's not in town, I'm still stopping because I know Phil travels a bunch. Of course, I want to thank my friends at the uh, Tombstone Epitaph, Arizona's longest running newspaper. Uh, you can find them at tombstoneepitaph.com. And my friends at the Wild West History Association, I uh, urge you to join that. It connects you with all the writers, Peter Brand, John Bosnecker, Roy Young, Kurt House, all the people that are in Western history today, right now, Sam Kilborn, all the people that are in Western history right now, they're part of the WWHA. And uh, we got our, our uh, 2023 agenda for wrap up this year or roundup, excuse me, this year is going to be in San Antonio, Texas. And we are staying at a hotel that is right across the street from the Alamo. You will literally walk out your front door. I think we're staying at the meager hotel or the mega hotel. And you step out the front door, you walk across the dirt road and you're in the front door of the Alamo. And I'm telling you, we are going to have a blast and we'd love to see you there. It's a fantastic trip. Again, Roundup 2023 is going to be in San Antonio, Texas at the Alamo. That's the Alamos in San Antonio, right? I think that's right. <laughs> that's right. Okay, because sometimes I get it wrong and then people are emailing me going, you're an idiot. Um, <laughs> and so you want to stay, uh, come see us at 2023. Also, you can find these podcasts on YouTube. If you have a family member that isn't so... Uh, doesn't understand getting it on an iPhone or an iPad or listening to the podcast on uh, uh, Spotify, you can go to my YouTube page and all the podcasts are there. This one will be up in about two or three days and it'll be ready to listen. So if you have somebody who understands YouTube better, then point them in that direction. You can find Cochise County Travels. You can actually search Wild West History or Cochise County underscore Travels and I pop right up. I'm searchable. Tap on that. Make sure that you follow, you subscribe and follow, and uh, leave a comment and a rating and a review because that helps the distribution because we don't get paid for these. We just do them because we, we love Phil. It's all about Phil. And um, <laughs> and I can't think of that. Anything before we go, sir? We're done. We're good. You're happy? Happy. Yes, okay. sir. Thank you very much. Yeah, you can.